Hello. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Valerie LeBlond and I am the program director at IDS. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and also new ones. Um, and before we start, I wanted to say a few words about IDS. So there are so many aspects that make it a unique, unique place, but Tonight, I really want to focus on ideas being a place for inspiration and collaborative research. My hope for the lecture series is that our guest speakers, who are all leaders uh, in their fields, will inspire new research, um, new areas, and find opportunities to innovate at the intersection of architecture and other disciplines. I do believe that if you're here tonight, if you made it here, whether that you're a student, a professional from the industry, a faculty member or a friend, you're one of us. And I know you have ideas. So please do share and spread the word. Um, I want to thank Hitoshi Abe, the chair of UCLA Architecture and Urban Design for creating ideas. And a special thanks to Paul and Herta Amir who generously support the lecture series, making this evening possible for us to share. I hope you really enjoyed this lecture and the many more to come. Uh, Qualcomm is uh, next in line with Smart City on February 18, and then we'll have Cirque du Soleil uh, to talk about creating on a tight wire on March 11. So, Please check out our website and for more information, and you're obviously welcome. Um, I am now going to hand over to our technology director, my colleague, Yvonne Chauzao, who is our host for tonight's lecture. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. I would like to welcome you again to UCLA Ideas. Uh, the mission of our program is to provide a platform where students and faculty are working together and exploring cutting edge methods and technologies through experimental and in-depth research topics, ranging from robotics to large-scale urban analysis and problem solving. By integrating innovative industry partners and nonprofits into our pedagogical framework, we intend to use the architectural school environment to explore real life issues as well as future scenarios on how the urban environment transforms through technology, research, and design. This experimental and unconventional model allows us to engage architecture with topics, innovations, and contexts that are traditionally seen outside of our discipline. Although robotics is just one of the avenues of research we're pursuing at IDEAS, it is certainly the one with the most physical presence, especially once we attach disco balls and lasers to them. Um, for that, I would like to thank Jason Payne, uh, one of our distinguished faculty here at UCLA Architecture and Urban Design, for his generosity to allow us to use his disco ball, which has become a long-time research project for him. As we are forming the pedagogical objectives of the program, we looked into contemporary novel applications of robots in architecture, and it is curiously stuck in the late 20th century notion of robots as industrial tools to fabricate objects. How could we go beyond this paradigm? How could we integrate robots into architecture as opposed to thinking of them as tools that make architecture? We quickly realized that this parallel alternative research intent is highly related to the tools that we use. Many applications of robotics require heavy programming knowledge, making it inaccessible for the typical skill set of the architect. That's how Bot and Dolly came into play for our setup. Bot and Dolly is a very innovative practice that has similarly thought out outside of the box and looked into ways of integrating robotics into creative applications for the entertainment and movie industry. Through R&D, they created an incredible software hardware platform called BD Move which allows an intuitive control of industrial robots natively within the Maya software platform. This full integration with a commercially available industry standard software allows a very precise and easy to use setup for camera work and CGI. 
It also makes, makes tasks that typically required heavy programming to reconfigure precise robot control camera angles of Rees since the robots could be reprogrammed on the fly through a workstation on set. I'm sure it certainly became a huge advantage as they were shooting the movie Gravity. The program allows for creating synchronized motions for up to 64 robots simultaneously. This issue of robot-to-robot -robot collaboration is a very special tool and is one of a kind, and there is no commercially available software on the market that allows such precise coordination that is also really easy to use. The speed of adjustability and ease of use, coupled with the fact that many of our students are familiar with Maya as a design software for architecture, made it the perfect technology for us exploring robotics in an architectural school context. They have kindly become one of our uh, first industry partners, and we became the first school to use their innovation, and it really jump-started our research here. They have been supporting us with many te technical issues ever since, and have been an inspiration to us through their innovative and creative projects that they share with us. We are thankful for our collaboration, and our robotics research would not have progressed with such speed and ease without their support and generous input. So far, through the help of Bot and Dolly, we had the opportunity to look into scenarios where architecture could transform its shape according to program and spatial complexity. We also continue to look into coupling robotics with sensing technology in order to imagine and devise an architecture that can reconfigure itself according to our needs and desires. This research will hopefully lead to the creation of dynamic spaces that question some of the very fundamental limitations of architecture, its permanence and its staticness. Besides technological innovation, the greatest strength of Bot and Dolly is their interdisciplinary approach. They have fused many creative fields together successfully in their practice. Their workforce is a diverse group of individuals spanning many different kinds of expertise, ranging from animators, software engineers, business strategists, designers, and architects. This unorthodox working methodology allows them to come up with unconventional and exhilarating projects, which become experiences in themselves that merge the digital and the physical worlds together. Now I would like to introduce you the speakers of tonight. Tobias Kinnebrew is the Director of Product Strategy at Batam Dali. For over a decade, Tobias has been leading strategic design thinking at the cutting edge of technology in experience, business, and engineering. After eight years at Microsoft, driving the design for companies' most radical and breakthrough products and experience concepts, he recently joined Batam Dali as Director of Product Strategy with the mission to advance the ability as humans to intuitively interface with the rapidly expanding number of robots populating our world. Matthew Bitterman is a product developer at Bot and Dolly. He creates computational tools and robotic fabrication processes which can optimize and automate building performance and production. Matthew has a diverse background in fabrication, environmental technology, boat building, architecture, and mechanical design. His former professional experiences includes working with Foster and Partners for Apple's new campus under construction, as well as Loisos and Lubeholde, a lighting and energy consultancy where he helped develop a system for monitoring and actuating buildings. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to present to you Bot and Dolly. Hi there. Hello. All right, that's working. Thanks for everybody. <laughs> Thanks yeah. everybody for coming out tonight. We're really excited to be here. Um, it's quite a big audience. Um. <laughs> yeah, and um, <clears throat> thank you for having us, um, UCLA. Thank you for including us in this lecture series. Um, it's an incredible set of topics that you've put together, and we are incredibly honored to be a part of it. Um, I'd say that we're also incredibly honored to be in some way a part of a uh, long-standing legacy on the part of UCLA architecture to uh, work at the cutting edge of the combination of new technologies and architecture, pushing the boundaries of what's possible there. <clears throat> um, 
what what's key to take away from um, tonight's presentation uh, is that the the core of Bot and Dahlia has always been uh, is is leveraging the synthesis of creativity and and technology. Um, over the years, we've done uh, tons of production work uh, uh, to, to basic that has forced uh, us having a better understanding of this friction between uh, a creative agenda and a technological agenda, um, forcing a sort of like uh, real intimacy with the, the issues that you grapple with trying to, to use technology to produce work, um, paid client work. I think, um, I think the right place for us to start <clears throat> may be the most important thing that I can tell you about Bot and Dolly. Um, help you understand what we're about is that we, uh, we have a garage door at the front of our studio. Um, it is much Instagrammed, very popular on the social networks. Uh, and behind that, I, I hope that's not killing all of your ears. Um, Behind that garage door um, is our coffee shop. And it is seemingly the most pretentious coffee shop in all of San Francisco. Uh, it's really an exercise in complete absurdity. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. It doesn't, it's absolutely uh, ridiculous. It doesn't make um, any money today or yet. Um, uh, it takes five minutes to get a cup of coffee here. Um, <laughs> what we really thought to talk about the coffee shop was is what it, it does a really good job explaining the sort of DNA um, of Bot and Dolly in that, uh, like for example, uh, the execution of an idea. Uh, we weren't coffee makers. When we set out to make a coffee shop, it was, it was about, uh, you know, for six months, the first six months you had to, uh, there was no brew bar, so the, there was a little stainless steel thing where we were serving coffee over that because they were waiting on the carpenter to make the giant elm table to put it on. There are um, these, these glass uh, pieces were all hand blown. Uh, you might walk in there one day, it was, uh, they weren't there because they were at the MoMA. Um, it was a sort of new uh, <laughs> exhibit on. <laughs> you can't order anything um, that you would normally order in another coffee shop. We don't make custom drinks. Uh, we only make what's on the menu, so if you think you're going to get your triple <laughs> mocha, latte, something, something, that's not going to happen. Yeah, you, did, you could only use heavy cream for six months, no. <laughs> Beans are hand-chosen and then hand-roasted and, uh, and then precision measured in custom containers and ground before your eyes and then filtered through a custom-designed, hand-blown filtration device of some kind. Yeah, these were these are machine shop produced these test tube holders. We laser cut the cork poppers. The uh, graphic design, you know, there was times when this was all handwritten on the paper bag because we couldn't get the font right. Um, we have a food you know, designer on staff. <laughs> food um, designer. And What's I, food I don't even designer? know what a food designer is. Um, I th I'm sure that we're the only coffee shop probably on the planet that has a food designer with an inexplicable job uh, uh, description. Um, and um, let's see. Um, <laughs> it's still very popular. There's quite a long line out in front. Um, but what's but what's really important though is once you get that cup of coffee, it's really good. It is. <laughs> it's it is. something that you've probably not had before. Uh, you you can't get a better cup of cup a uh, cup of coffee in San Francisco. Um, and it might that's take a 20 minutes, statement. but you can have. <laughs> so um, so this was a dream. And uh, to Matthew's point, uh, this was a dream and an idea that, uh, that we had had uh, as a company for a number of years, and then we just went into make mode, and we executed on it. And we executed down to the detail of every little meticulous aspect of the aesthetic experience and the, uh, the sensory experience, and we brought it to life. And that is the way that you would walk into or enter uh, the Bottendale studio. Also important to note that this, you will either be Hugely successful. There'll probably be 60 of these, or you won't see it ever again. <laughs> yeah, may not be there in a year. We might have done something completely different with the space. Um, when you walk through the back of the coffee shop, uh, what you see is that Button Dolly is a creative design studio, uh, and it's also a robotics studio. Um, 
any we given day. Have a, uh, we have a, a very unique culture that, as Matthew said, is, uh, is the result of us building over time a synthesis between um, the artist and the engineer. And uh, it's through the process of building project after project after project um, and always focusing on our mission to bring artistic vision to life um, through the application of technology um, that we have become incredibly, um, incredibly good at um, that friction space between art and engineering and uh, lubricating that space and making it work for us on our behalf. And we think of that as the engine that propels the kind of conceptual experience, design thinking um, that is our job at Bot and Dolly. And um, we're constantly coming up with ideas that are just on the edge of what we think might be plausible and working to close the gap between plausible and possible. And we don't do that um, just because we love it, which we totally do. Um, we also do that because it's a business imperative for us. Um, we operate as a company. Um, we have to profit from at least a, a handful of our projects in order to continue to be able to do what we do. Um, and so through a lot of ingenuity and elbow grease, um, uh, we constantly manage to move things from that plausible side to that possible side and, and realize what it is that, um, that we've born in the space of imagination. In this space, uh, we're, constantly, uh, we're constantly faced with challenges um, in translating the way we think as humans and the way we imagine as humans um, uh, into a space that is technology-driven, um, translating human into technology from a language standpoint. Um, we think that this is where most of, our, um, most of our most valuable innovation happens. It is uh, an inspiration to us when we have the opportunity to confront a space uh, like, like robotics, a, a, um, a space where the tools to realize what it is that we can dream up really haven't existed. Um, and make advances, build and evolve that tool set um, in order to enable us to create something. What really inspires us is when those tools um, are out there in the world and being put to work, um, not in the service of realizing our own idea, but in the service of realizing uh, thousands of ideas on behalf of thousands of thinkers and creatives and artists. Um, across industries and across domains. But, um, you know, what I would say is our true inspiration uh, is the future. And what gets us out of bed in the morning for sure is a belief that um, this work that we do at the connection point um, between the way we think and work as humans and um, the way we generate expectations and manage behaviors on the part of robotics we believe that solving those hard problems is, um, is critical in enabling humans to more broadly uh, put robotics to work in the world around us in ways that we are today only beginning to imagine. I think um, you, you maybe deserve to hear a little bit about how this relationship between us uh, as artists and Bot and Dolly um, began. And um, one day, several years ago, um, it began with a kind of a jailbreak, um, a six-axis industrial arm manufacturing robot um, somehow broke loose from its position on the line and ended up at our door. One lucky <laughs> robot. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was lucky, um, but <clears throat> also, it was, also it was different. Uh, there was something peculiar about this robot. It had to be peculiar about this robot to come and hang out with us. Um, maybe a little bit more poetry. Maybe a little bit of a different aspiration about its future. Um, 
And when it arrived, we, we were curious ourselves um, about what, what this would mean in terms of uh, collaboration, what kinds of things we might build together. Um, and uh, we didn't know. And we didn't know what it was capable of, and we didn't know how we might use it. Um, but we did know that, or rather I should say, we had a 100% a, a hunch that something was going to happen here that was significant to the future and somehow ultimately meaningful to the world. Um, and uh, it came with a story uh, because um, it, was a foreign, it was a foreigner in a foreign land. Um, as artists, we had no business messing around with trying to communicate with this machine. Um, it was not the same as us. And, um, and that's what its story is about. And as storytellers ourselves, um, we decided to work with it and put that together into a little bit of a piece, uh, which I, I, I think we should watch. The, the grandfather might have been a metaphor for the robot. My grandfather was an immigrant, the first of my family to come to this country. When he arrived, they didn't know what to make of him or what to do with him. They left him waiting in a small room while they argued over his paperwork, how to fill in the blanks, which boxes to check. They left him waiting for days in a room that opened only from the outside. And when he was quite forgotten, it came to him. I don't know what you'd call it, his muse, his mojo, his raison d'etre, his rapture. But it lifted him, and it smote him like a grand mall seizure. And he found that what they always said was wrong. If you looked directly into the light, it wasn't blinding. It brought exquisite clarity and a marvelous depth of field. And when they finally came back and unlocked the door to ask him a few more questions, they found nothing left but a stain on the floor, his pendant, and a slight turbulence in the air. He had slipped the surly bonds of earth, as the poets say. He was no poet, my grandfather, but he knew what he had to do. the idea that somehow these things are, are part of our part of our family now <laughs> which is a little weird but we're a little weird and hey so we're gonna play a lot of media content tonight um we've worked really hard on it. if you guys could just all like clap after each one we'll feel like we're showing you things you care to see and then we'll be more confident up here so thanks um our, our, first, <clears throat> our first project with the robots, so we had them, we didn't know what they were gonna do. We were just starting to get control of them. Uh, we got a job from uh, Louis Vuitton to sort of do a conceptual piece on, uh, with astronomers, uh, pretty notable ones. Uh, and we were just learning how to program these things. Um, astronauts, sorry. Um, yeah, astronauts. Uh, like uh, dudes that walked on the moon. Um, <laughs> this. <laughs> was a theme for our early business, but uh, we, uh, we got the job and we started to shoot it, and I'd like to play it for you now. Big for Louis Vuitton. 15, 14, 13, Ready for 12, 12, 11, 11, 10, 10 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, I just wanted to get, get to go into space. I mean, I wasn't really focused on being the first woman. I was just focused on getting up uh, into space as soon as I could. Why me? <laughs> Why on 13? Should have been yeah. Al Shepard. Why not wait to 14? Yeah. Or, or do it on 12. <laughs> and somebody, after you go through that, why me? The black sky, the horizon curving away, the brilliance of the sun, the earth 
up there at where we are and said the most beautiful things that somebody could think of when you think about the words. At first it sounded funny, but one small step for a man and a giant leap for mankind. We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. So what did I know how to do? Be a spaceman. Think about the future. Here go for landing over. So, Somehow, um, thematically, we got involved in space. Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, I've, so thematically, somehow, um, space became uh, important to us for, for a few years. Um, this project was amazing because um, it, it involved... Um, it involved looking at two things we thought were fascinating. Uh, one is uh, introducing robotics as characters um, in the narrative, and second, um, to introduce the, the movement and the lens of the, of the, of the camera itself um, as a way of telling the story, which I think comes to bear um, in gravity very heavily. Um, but we also, uh, we, it's, it's a really nice way to put it to say that we learned a lot on this, uh, on this project. Um, we completely had our asses handed to us because um, we learned how incredibly challenging it was in the state of robotics programming tools at that time, this is several years ago, um, to accomplish what it is that we were doing. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we were trying to precisely control in synchronicity many robots working in the same space, um, and the, the tools simply weren't there. So um, we began, as a result of this work, uh, to try and solve that problem to um, strengthen our own ability to put them to work. And uh, we, we invested as much as we could, um, and we built ourselves uh, software interfaces and capabilities that would allow us to... Um, <clears throat> work with these as creative tools, uh, but you know they were the tools at that time were uh, just about good enough for us to work with them, understanding all of their quirks and all of their hiccups um, and their limitations. Um, and so, for us, um, the Louis Vuitton moment was uh, was was an important one because um, it forced us into a mode of making tools. Um, when some nice folks from Warner Brothers approached us with um, what they described as an impossible challenge, um, trying to work with us and our technology to bring to life something that communicate to an audience what it would be like to be in a weightless environment, um, a place they would never be able to be. Um, well, we knew that tackling that and being able to introduce robotics to a uh, production at a feature film level would require us to build a much, much more robust tool set. I would say not only that, um, but we needed to work on, on two very different ends of a production. Uh, one of them was enabling the director in the course of filmmaking to actually interact with and manipulate and work with um, how the robots were, were moving on set in real time, um, something for which software did not exist at the time. Um, and also, um, we had to enable effectively the pre-visualization workflow. Imagine there's a huge, huge crew of people that are, are, are all heads down for months and months and months trying to define exactly what's going to happen at every moment while you're actually shooting. <clears throat> and um, as Gavanch mentioned, um, this is where we, we began investing in enabling folks that had expertise in Maya to be able to approach robot programming. Um, let's take a look at what they saw when they walked into the studio after our first test. Right, so this, this is a behind the scenes video we're gonna play for you of, of an idea where rather than move the actor, uh, we'd move the world around the actor, move the cameras around, move the lights around uh, to, to give the feeling of outer space. Uh, we didn't have the tool at the time, but uh, we could point to point control, like hey, go here, go here, go here, um, to kind of fake it uh, for proof of concept. Um, and uh, what that looked like. Let's build a stairway to the 
stars A lovely, lovely stairway to the stars It would be heaven to climb to heaven with you So we got that seed money we were hoping to develop a real tool instead of hacking. Uh, and a few months later, we were on set in London with a tool we call BD Move Now, which is here in the studio, uh, and uh, an interface for someone like Alfonso Cuaron to scrub through moves. Um, yeah, it's also um, it's, it's worth mentioning as well that um, this interface is designed to interact with robotics and actually um, multiple robotic systems um, using a concept of time, which um, maybe that seems pretty straightforward um, in retrospect, but at that time it was a uh, it was a very very different approach to thinking about robotic movement in the world. Um, yeah, we we had to get serious um, because we needed multiple robot actors to be able to to move in real time together, uh, and. The prior robots we had, the Fanix, they weren't going to do it. Um, with this, you know, with having some decent investment, we were able to partner with a, a robot manufacturer, Kuka, um, to actually get under the skirt of these things and do some low-level stuff that that enabled uh, synchronous motion, um, which is obviously imperative for any kind of visual effects and motion control. Uh, yeah, and it wasn't just us. Um, and this is something that we've taken forward as a, a capability um, and something we learned from. Uh, from that exercise, um, it wasn't just us that needed to be thinking in terms of time on, on a shoot like that. Um, in fact, there are like a dozen other things going on in the set that are also all incredibly time synced. Um, so our timeline, in fact, became sort of the master timeline and, and the robotics um, uh, became the, the way that we would trigger a lot of other events on the set. So if you look here, you can see uh, our motion control rig inside uh, a light box, um, this, and then the actor in a pan tilt yaw, uh, a sort of rig around the waist. Um, our robot having six axes of freedom on a slide, which makes seven, and then another three axis on the end of the robot to to give ultimately what is like a ten axis machine, which is wild. But um, what this enabled the VFX company to do was to um, have complete control of that camera at the end. They could do pre-vis, there was eight months of pre-visualization on the film. Uh, and what they could do then is hand that to a physicist uh, to, to be able to, to, to actually create Brownian motion or, or physics events that are true to outer space to create a camera field that would have been you know, akin to actually floating. Um, and uh, yeah. And so that's what that kind of looked like. And then we'll show you. Uh, I hope you have seen Gravity. The, the final product did, it did turn out pretty well. Um, it's gotten some attention lately. Um, <laughs> yep. Here it is. Beautiful, don't you think? What? The sunrise. Terrific.
So that, that was... Um, it's worth taking a look. Now, that, that, was, that was tons of fun, but it leveled us up, um, and it opened all sorts of new avenues that we've been moving down to, um, to work in media. Um, we, we're, we're way beyond media now, um, and we're, our eyes are just like, you know, incredibly large, looking at all sorts of areas of the world where we know robotics will be applicable. But um, I think it's worth taking a look at the, um, the real uh, for Bot and Dolly to get a sense of where we've taken uh, what we did there with our tool set. Yeah, that was three years ago. Also worth mentioning that that was shot. It's been in post-production for two and a half years. Meanwhile, we had this tool set. Um, here's some of the stuff that we did. So I think we'll spend um, some time now taking a look at some of the projects and um, talking a bit about the process um, that we go through when we develop creative concepts, um, mash them together with um, engineering capabilities. Um, this, I, I think this was your first day. <laughs> so yeah, so um, this, this was my first day on the job about two years ago. Um, what we're gonna talk about is, we didn't always think of ourselves as tool builders. We were just trying to get stuff done um, and, and had a creative agenda, uh, liked using technology. This, I walked in and, and, and they, were, uh, they were dipping uh, somebody in a 500 gallon vat of blue paint um, and then uh, creating this giant emoticon here with, with that, that person. That, um, that poor fellow's butt. Um. Yeah, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, what we can use this next section to talk about is really like what goes into these crazy productions because this is like this is a very you know a very serious thing it's it's whimsical but uh at the same time we're solving a lot of problems uh like that canvas had to be compliant right there's like bungee cords so that there's good you know cushion to get the right smear and uh you know, all sorts of things. Uh, obviously, a ton don't, of don't try this here right in the studio. at home. And uh, this never happened actually. But it did. Uh, it did lend itself to a job with the same group of blue, little blue men uh, that uh, became a whoop, sorry, a Vegas production. Um, and here's what what that looked like. We actually. Uh, you know, we're contacted by blue men after that job to say, hey, let's put some on stage. Um, that involved, you know, a huge integration project, uh, safety protocols, you know, uh, whole safety PLCs, there were safety mats, there are uh, all sorts of triggers for the hardware, there's, there's, you know, there's mechanical design and engineering of the, the, uh, the tooling um, that's, again, synchronous robotics. So this, for example, is the beaks on those robots that are made to look like kind of beaks, but uh, are also, uh, you know, shapes so that if it picks the tool up at an angle, it'll still center um, and, and close on that. Uh, this is a machining <laughs> product. We have a whole machine shop set up to do this kind of work. And uh, some <clears throat> something you'll notice here is the, um, uh, the a lot, some of the background um, that some of the 
people have um, brought to Batan Dali is from advertising or other um, artistic or creative fields. And so everything that we make, we make um, with style and with beauty because we believe that's important also to the way the world thinks about how it, how it works. Um, this was a project, this was a crazy project. Um, I think it was two months, Jeff says it was four weeks. Uh, it was, I think it was two months, but uh, um, this was a project, an interactive project that we did for uh, the I.O. conference, Google's I.O. conference um, a couple of years ago uh, that was meant to celebrate, um, it was meant to celebrate kind of, um, you know, interactive media. Uh, the, the Nexus Q was a, was a prototype and idea device, which is kind of a ball like that. Um, that uh, was was used as a sort of media hub. Um, they wanted to to create a project that uh, kind of spoke to the open source movement um, and spoke to you know uh, their clientele being able to interact with technology in new ways. Um, so we created uh, this installation um, which had the giant sort of queue on top of a, a robot um, that you could go up and and you could drive it and you could actually create music. Uh, so, um, I just want to talk about a little, a lot of the things that we actually went through as a studio um, to implement this. Uh, you see in this slide there, uh, we had a whole structural engineering project uh, where you know it had to be engineered so this didn't tip over and, and hurt anybody. We had um, some great composites guys, friends of family here, uh, Bill Chrysler and other people. Uh, fabricating this ball, um, which is a fiberglass ball. Um, we had a musical composer online that was developing music that could be parametrically driven by whatever was happening uh, from the user input. We had, um, you know, the low voltage wiring and, and uh, the sort of uh, the LED screens that were driven by the same real time devices. Uh, we had on the TVs down there. There were it was a heads up display to show where the ball was relative to where you were trying to go and a live compositing of, of, of your position and your, and your other people that you were interacting with position, creating this music, musical score. Um, this is the device here um, on the lower part that uh, was a sort of the media hub, basically a giant encoder. Um, and then the ADK there, that's basically a, an Arduino equivalent, which is you know, sort of Google's uh, uh, you know, uh, embedded uh, or, well, guess like kind of open source programmable microprocessor, um, except it was really fancy. It had LEDs and a barometer. Um, and uh, there, there and was, so, yeah, so basically the idea here was that you could in real time control all of this, go up and drive the robot, which is, which is crazy. And, and for us, that was a huge technical feat to be able to actually live drive all these things together. And I think also, um, so there were three of these interfaces, and one was primarily to interact with the music, another was um, primarily to interact with the uh, a particular axis on the robot and its movement. Um, the, the thing is that this really was the first time that we'd done something that uh, required um, that we set something out in the world and uh, design it such that the world could engage with it directly. Um, we, we, had, we had done projects that involved um, data consumed by hundreds of thousands of people to drive a robot, but we'd never had it sort of physically in the same space um, and tried to make that uh, compelling and safe and, and feel like it was... Um, on and, time. And, yeah, well, the on time bit was also <laughs> which, really Which almost didn't happen. Um, one of the projects was actually getting the, we had, we had um, deflection problems, so like this thing was like wobbling and it was gonna shake itself off the robot and destroy itself um, very seriously. So we had to like implement a software solution to like create a brownie motion to dampen the resonant frequency so it wouldn't fall off and we wouldn't get sued. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, here's the, here's Again, the, the dangers actual, of running a business. <laughs> <laughs> here's, what, here's, a, here's the behind the scenes.
Um, uh, this is a fascinating project um, where we um, partnered up with the San Francisco Ballet. Um, we did some we did some amazing work. Uh, you know, um, to me, this project most directly speaks to um, actually the title of the lecture. Um, the title of the lecture, Precision and Movement, um, I think that I need to give you a sense of how we think about that. Um, precision to us is all about uh, the engineering and the precision of the machinery um, and all about the, the way that that machinery um, in some sense thinks about the world. Um, movement for us is all about the human and the real world. Um, and when we think about precision and movement, we think about two very, very different kinds of things. Um, interacting in the same space, or in many cases in the same space, um, and, and orchestrating um, and composing um, both the precision and the movement together to create something um, that they couldn't create on their own. So, um, in, in this project we were really interested in, uh, obviously like, so dealing with any digital production technique, um, it's good upon itself when you have uh, a, 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 a lack of continuum from a digital, a digital to physical world um, production, uh, there become problems, right? That's evident in any kind of manufacturing issue, uh, uh, tolerance control, um, and in, in our case, uh, sacks of water that, that aren't, aren't repeatable, right? Uh, human beings, um, which are always on set. Uh, how we deal with that has is, is been a huge problem. Um, and the way we began dealing with that was working with expert kung fu artists, um, ballet dancers, um, which is exactly the, the idea behind this piece. Um, it's, it's sort of a poetic thing, more like, okay, you know, you're, you learn ballet by repeating the same motions over and over and over again, uh, very much, very robotic-like. Um, and uh, that enabled us to kind of work really intimately with them. This project was uh, a choreography um, but uh, the way that we began to program this was by using uh, a motion capture uh, a rig to, to first give us something to work with, uh, which um, this technology is, is, is out there. It's, it's quite, uh, I'm sure you guys know, uh, it, it gives you 3D data in time of wherever the sensor locations are. Uh, this enabled us to get a, a real idea of where these dancers were going to be at, at any moment in their choreography and then enable us to have a digital model by which we could we could choreograph the robotic movement to get what we were hoping was a sort of a new kind of look at at dance, right? A more intimate sort of uh, engagement. And and <clears throat> and putting the the camera in places where like it really should be impossible for the camera to go um, because it's right in the way of the ballerina, or uh, uh, or it's making impossible spin around the dancer, um, but. The reason why I think this piece is super interesting is because we, um, we're, we're also constantly looking at the challenge of trying to translate back and forth between the, um, the digital world and the physical world. Um, and by back and forth, um, it, it speaks directly to the power of our, of our software, but also of our creative challenges. Um, um, software, the, uh, the software that we use, um, it, it allows us to backdrive information about physical position into the software, so uh, we can physically move the robot in a way, and then um, capture that position, and then understand it back in the place where we're trying to construct its behavior and compose its behavior. Um, in this case, we're pulling information out of the physical world about the dan dancer's positions, um, and uh, integrating that in a virtual environment in which we're also composing robotic behavior that translation is absolutely critical to um, a lot of our work. And it's also the biggest problem. I mean, we are, this technology is nascent. Feedback cycles are, are of the utmost importance in the future. Um, obviously, it's something that we're working hard on. Uh, another example of why you need that um, continuum to be uh, at least at least a recursive continuum uh, is, is because, uh, like, this is another example of uh, behind the scenes, a job that we did. Um, for Under Armour to get a, a kind of high-tech shot of, of footwear. Um, and we had to embarrass our colleague for a week to just having her do this motion over and over again to make sure that our camera motion would capture the foot when we had the talent on set, because we couldn't screw it up. And 
And there she is over and over and over again. She had to run across there because we had to make sure that we could mark out those locations in space on the floor when we got on set and that when the actor did the move, it was going to repeat and get the shot. Um, these kind of um, on-set tools, uh, we've been in development for, for a very long time, especially on a big film shoot. Uh, you know, there could, you know, each hour is a very expensive thing if we're reprogramming or, uh, you know, reanimating a move. Um, and so that, uh, which, yeah. So that ended up being a small commercial piece. Uh, our portion was very small, but it's, uh, it was a important there, one. Um, a few years ago, um, we began mucking around with several different technologies to um, <clears throat> to look at how it is that we could create um, real-time animated projection um, on something at the end of a robotic arm um, to bring some kind of character to life in the, in the physical world that would otherwise be digital. Um, and this is just this is interesting because um, it was, this kind of represents uh, us mucking around, hacking and dabbling in technology um, just at the idea level. Um, and that's something that we do all the time. And we've always got different threads of that going on in the studio. Um, this, this particular exploration, it evolved. Um, and uh, a couple of years later, uh, it took very solid form. Um, and the application of these technologies and a whole number of other technologies we've been working with um, became the catalyst for uh, putting <clears throat> engineering thinking and design thinking together um, in, a, in, in very much an iterative process, um, dreaming about what would be possible if we really leverage the precision understanding and placement to the sub-millimeter of things in the physical world um, combined with physical action in a physical environment and physical actors. Um, and how would we tell stories around that? Uh, so the little monkey, the monkey head, uh, that was our first foray into 3D projection mapping. Uh, why I said it was, it was a you know something that we did after hours, um, and 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 that continued for for a long time, just kind of as a sort of general uh, prerogative, uh, maybe technology for technology's sake, but also just kind of seeing what we could do with the tools we were messing around with. Uh, at, at some point, uh, we decided to kind of throw everything at uh, that we had it to create a demo um, because we saw opportunity there. Um, uh, 3D projection mapping being, uh, the difference being uh, than creating a, a media piece that's found online is that you can experience it in, in, in person. Uh, and so uh, you know, we had, uh, and the one thing that's really unique, we're talking about Box now if you've seen it, uh, was that we had a, a lot of really hyper talented design dudes and tech dudes that got together and said, let's do this crazy thing. Uh, decided to tell a story on the five tenets of magic, uh, or, or five of ten, the showcase of technology, and, and uh, created a visual language um, by which we were going to tell that. Um, and then, basically here, uh, sorry, next slide, uh, match this together to produce what we call box. We're going to play it, it's five minutes, uh, and then we'll talk about how it was done.
Thanks. Um, I, I'm guessing that a lot of you had already seen that. Um, I, I keep watching it and I can't get enough of it. Um, so um, we, we made Box partly as um, a, a passionate pursuit um, of the design experience. Um, and we also made it partly um, to showcase some of our technical capabilities. Um, and we, we put it out on the internet in the fall. Um, not expecting anything like the kind of response that we saw. And that was very exciting to us because it clearly connected with a, a much larger audience in terms of excitement around uh, an experience involving robotics than we had expected. Um, not to mention that the, uh, like I, I think, I think um, like we got calls from all around the planet, hey, what is this? Um, is it possible to, to use this kind of technology in, in some form for some performance. It was a, it was a great response. Um, Matthew, you want to tell us a little bit about the making of and the challenges? Yeah, you're kind of seeing it. Um, this, this was like the ultimate kind of mashup of, of like kind of threw everything we had at, at the wall and, 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 and to see what we could get. Um, this involves um, calibrating uh, a zillion robots, which is a huge problem for us. We do it all the time. Uh, days of calibration. Uh, we have th three robot actors, a uh, projector to calibrate, um, camera, nodal point, um, and then uh, and then there's seven different softwares that were used um, to, to, to create all the visual effects and the rendering, uh, synchronizing the 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 actual um, geometric uh, relationships between uh, the camera's perspective uh, and the uh, the perspective of the um, illusions taking place. We used um, motion capture to actually get a handheld feel. So if you notice that the camera is actually moving through there, so as the camera moves, all the perspectives have to change to follow the camera. Uh, we uh, th there was DMX lighting controls that were synchronized to the effects. Uh, um, it was it was quite a feat, um, and in the end, it was you know 20 people five weeks to, to create this thing uh, <clears throat> for the, the last, last crunch. Last, the last crunch when we finally decided to go ahead and actually do it. Um, and it was, yeah, it's, it's been, it was a lot of fun. It was really hard. Um, and like I said, we didn't really ever, like, what we kind of use this as an example is to talk about us um, kind of engaging with the friction between a creative agenda and, a, and, and technology. Uh, not not because we're saying we're good at it, but just that we're we're always negotiating it. So here's seven different softwares. How do we get them to talk to each other? Um, and yeah, what's and, uh, likewise, um, 
a, a hyper talented design director leading a design team uh, working with um, really talented technical directors and engineers and um, that conversation becoming sort of the ultimate creative conversation we have a, a growing palette of technologies to bring to bear to create an experience we have um, and, and in turn we can expand what it is that we could create graphically and visually as a result of that palette yeah but we didn't always have that stuff though, I mean, that was always, like we were always just trying to do something cool and then by virtue of that, trying to figure out how to do it and then that talent kind of came or because we were kind of weird, they showed up uh, and, and wanted to do something weird too. Um, but yeah, getting, getting on to sort of the next whoop, um, section and, 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 and final one is, uh, you know, so move, move came about three years ago um, um when, when Gravity was shot, anyways, in the first kind of iteration of that. Since then, we've done a lot of stuff to develop these tools. Uh, you know, advanced stuff, like we incorporated, uh, like, nodal point calibration for lenses, so you can find the center of the lens, so you can pivot around that. Uh, it's pretty important, uh, as you swap lenses all the time on a film set. I think um, where we're headed is also, um, just wanted to talk a little bit about, I know we're running long, a little bit about um, different kinds of advances we're making in the way humans interface with robotics. Um, uh, Beating Move is a great example because, again, it thinks in uh, what's actually a, a, um, a fundamentally human term in time. Um, uh, you also can see that we, we do work in um, hardware and, and uh, physical interaction as well. Um, let's. So this, this kind of work happens in our studio um, and in our machine shop, and uh, these, are, these are things that we, we actually build and then productize and put out there in the world to use to control robots in particular ways. Um, and uh, we, we have some new techniques that, uh, or we're, we're always working on new techniques, new ways of um, explaining the way I think about it, which is why I'm not a roboticist, um, explaining to the robot what it is that we want it to do. Um. Yeah, so these hardware products are one way. Okay, it's a knob, whatever. You can use it to assign shaky college hand effect and, and drive it up so somebody can just get up there and grab it. Uh, another way we're kind of developing that is to use uh, uh, um, motion capture to record a motion path, right? Rather than have a, have a uh, you know, a cinematographer have to learn to animate, just give them a camera. Also have that. Um, if you give them a pen, that one. I think um, what, what we see is where we put our energy, which is n new ways of uh, interacting and interfacing with the robot. But uh, in some cases, that means that we're doing deep work on UIs that are easy and more accessible to use or abstract what we're asking to be done uh, up to a higher level. And in other cases, like what we see there with, um, with the robot drawing with the human, um, we're, we're just trying to um, conceptually overturn the way we even think about asking machines to behave in particular ways. Um, and so that, that's been the core of our development for uh, a while, but um, what's even better news is like for the last couple of years we haven't even been working on that so much. Um, we've been working on uh, a new tool set we're calling Build uh, that we're excited to talk about, um, new way of programming uh, in, a, in an entirely different interface. Uh, uh, to allow you to make stuff, 
um, which you guys do here, and there's a lot of people out there that are interested in doing that. Uh, as a means of talking about that, um, th this being, so move, move for us was a, is an explicit way of, of modeling an exact motion uh, in, in time, time being an important criteria. Uh, this new way we're thinking about programming, and, and many are, uh, is, is iterative and procedural. So rather than it being explicit instructions, like be here at exactly this moment, um, we just want you to get a task done, like go here and get this done. Um, and uh, as such, we're looking at uh, parametric interfaces to sort of drive that. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with parametric design, uh, it's, it's basically you have a series of input parameters that drive an, an outcome, um, and a bunch of relationships are built on top of that. Uh, in this visual example, you could have a surface that's broken up into a series of lines, that could be used to define frames and planks, let's say, let's say that's the side of a wooden boat or something. Um, where this becomes powerful is that once you have all those relationships set up, uh, you can change the input parameters, let's say the surface or the number of planks, um, and get a new outcome, right? So it's, it's automation in a geometric sense. Uh, that could be automation in a computational sense. It could be a different way to say, hey, go here. Um, you're always going to use these certain instructions to get there, but uh, start and end is different. Uh, and and that, can, that can build up to be quite a powerful thing. Um, in this example, it could be like the material limitations of those pieces of wood. It could be the, the joint spacing. It could be uh, deflection, or it could be a structural uh, criteria that's driving that. Um, and so... Uh, we'll show you the first thing we've done with it, um, and uh, we can talk about it afterwards. Um, obviously, what we think becomes really powerful is when it's not just a digital model, but when it's linked to uh, a production one. So um, what I find most fascinating about that is uh, what you see going on in the iPad interface. I mean, uh, imagine um, getting to a point where we can build a wall like that with um, you know, uh, simply saying, I want it to be this high, I want it to be this wide, and I want it to follow that squiggle. I My mean, grandma can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know your grandma, but that's great news. <laughs> <laughs> It is, actually. <laughs> That's good news. Um, yeah, well, it becomes really powerful. And, and while we're not suggesting necessarily that the goal here is to make weird walls, um, what we're suggesting is that the intelligence can be embedded in a system computationally uh, by really smart people that know a lot of stuff about something uh, and that then can be driven by anybody, right? And that's a, that's a powerful idea. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's... That's yeah. kind of the state of affairs. I think um, I think that's that's a uh, that's a good that's a good inside look. That's that's uh, that's <laughs> Bhatt and Dali. I'd, I'd say um, you know uh, again the way to think about what we do. Um, it's that synthesis between the artistic vision and engineering execution, um, and uh, that's that's what that's what our engine is. Yeah, I think, I think one point I'd like to drive home just in closing is that, uh, you know, when we got our first robot, we didn't really know what it was going to do for us. Um, it, 
it is that that kind of speculation um, where you have a you have a hunch like okay yeah there's obviously a lot of things that this is going to elucidate that there are great potentials here um, for for who knows um, it was for film when we started and then we we started realizing that the real power was in creating workflows um, for any any creative industry maybe it's maybe it's fabrication too maybe it's you know who knows what's next uh, and uh, and, and, and when, you, when we're, we're excited to be a part of something like this, where I think that um, there's a lot of smart people in this room that are making the same uh, speculations uh, and, and, and have built this place to, to see what, what is possible out there. And, and we're excited to see that. We're excited to be a part of that. Um, and, and, you know, we don't always know what we're doing, any of us, um, but that it's worth, it's worth doing. And uh, I hope that you guys are inspired by uh, some projects that actually paid them for themselves mostly, and uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> and um, when when you when you dream about a coffee shop and you have all of the kinds of toys that we have to bring to bear, uh, but you end up with a coffee shop that is insanely overdesigned, <laughs> but 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 makes great coffee. Yeah, um, uh, and there might yeah. even be a brewery brewing in the back background. Yeah. Keep that on the DL. <laughs> Thanks, guys.